Hey Katie. Hey Alex. Great to meet up with you here on Mozart Snapshot. Thanks, it's great to see you too. And by the way, that was one magical and mysterious cave. Does it remind you of anything? Well, you know, I always think of music and that to me is exactly a perfect setting for the magic flute. I thought so. Well, this was once a secret meeting place of the Freemasons and the Illuminati. Really? And there is a local legend that Mozart took this little cave with its waterfall as an inspiration for the setting of the magic flute. Fascinating. But you know, if he did that, I would think that the Freemasons and the Illuminati would not have been too happy with him for divulging one of their secret meeting locations in an opera. That's right. Anyway, you said you're going to show me a special little wooden house today. That's right. It's actually a little wooden cottage. And at one time, it sat in the garden of a theater complex in Vienna, and Mozart composed one of his most famous operas inside. Ah, das Zauberflötenhäuschen. Exactly right, the magic flute house. Didn't Shikaneda actually lock Mozart inside? You know, we don't know if that's actually true. It is a story that you hear, but, you know, like a lot of things, it could be just a story. But what is for sure is that Schikaneder allowed Mozart the use of this little cottage while he was composing so that he could have some peace and quiet and not have to go to and from home every day. Because in 1791, at that time, he had an incredible amount of music to write. So, how did the great opera come about? Well, the story goes back to the fact that Schikaneder was the director of a theater in Vienna, which was called the Freihaus Theater on der Wieden. And Schikaneder decided to approach Mozart with the idea of writing an opera in German, in which Schikaneder himself would sing one of the principal roles. A tale of dragons, bird catchers, trials, and tribulations. Exactly, because Schikaneder's Freihaus Theater presented really everything from operas to ballets to plays to orchestral concerts and especially a genre that was particularly popular at the time, which was called Kasperoper or Zauberoper. Kasperoper, popular in Vienna for centuries. That's right, and Kasperoper, who was earlier known as Hans Wurst, was a character much like Pulcinella or Petrushka, and Papageno is actually based on the Hans Wurst character. What exactly was Zauberoper? Literally, magic opera. It was a type of singspiel that was sung in the vernacular, so in German. And they didn't have just real people as characters, but they had the Hans Wurst-like characters, and then they had mythological creatures or animals or ghosts or magicians. And the plots? Well, the plots were normally comic or fairy tale, and so they were set in exotic or mysterious faraway places, and uh, they dealt with themes like the clash between good and evil, or, uh, you know, the triumph of love over difficult challenges. That describes the magic flute exactly. It does, because the magic flute is, and was, always a fairy tale on the surface. And in 1791, when the magic flute was first produced, it was a spectacle like we can't even imagine today, because there were flying characters that went across the stage, and fireworks, and trap doors, and unbelievably elaborate stage sets and costumes, all in the style of these German magic operas. Sounds quite different than modern day opera stage design. Very different. But then, of course, like everything with Mozart, the magic flute is not just a superficial fairy tale. It has a lot of hidden, deep meanings, and scholars believe that Mozart and Schikaneder based the opera on Masonic ideals like virtue and courage and emotional fulfillment after trials and tribulations. Mozart and Schikaneder were both Freemasons. They were, as were a number of the people in the Freihaus Theater. However, Schikaneder had actually been expelled from his particular uh, Freemason Lodge because of his um, free ways. Did they meet through a Freimaurerloge? 
actually not. They met back in Salzburg in the year 1780 because at that time Schikaneder was the manager of a traveling troupe and they had a prolonged stay in Salzburg and they did all, all kinds of various spectacles in the Municipal Theater in Salzburg. And Mozart composed music for Schikaneder's troupe and in return Schikaneder gave the whole Mozart family um, tickets to come as much as they wanted. And so consequently they went to the theater quite frequently and became good friends. So let's go ahead through this magical scenery. Okay. So this is where he composed the magic flute. It is indeed. And this little cottage was actually sitting in the ornamental garden of the large courtyard of the Freihaus Theater, which at that time was just in the outskirts of Vienna. And it was a perfect solution because that way Mozart could compose in here during the day and then they could also do rehearsals with the singers. And is this the way it looked? The wood, which is made out of spruce, was actually painted a reddish-brown color on the outside, and then on the inside, it was painted in a silvery-gray tone, and there was a small wooden table, and a yellow couch, and then two round, low-back chairs. Sounds sehr gemütlich. I can imagine Boyford sitting right there in this little place away from real life. His imagination just soaring. I can too, and you know, I think that's what makes the magic flute truly so magical, because it's such a perfect realization of Mozart's vivid imagination. And, you know, Mozart didn't just write the music for it, but he was involved in the whole concept of this opera, and many scholars believe that he helped Schikaneder compose the libretto and bring in a lot of the Masonic elements. The opera was very close to Mozart's heart. Exactly. And you know, this story of darkness turning to light and um, chaos to enlightenment through a series of trials. And then, of course, this, this lifelong quest for love. I mean, this was a topic in Mozart's own life. There were some rumors that he had an affair here. And maybe it was not just in this little house during the daytime. Yeah, well... Scholars have not actually found any real proof of that, so I'm not so sure if that was true or not. And plus, remember, Mozart also wrote a number of letters to Constanza at the time, telling her that he was at home at night and was terribly lonely without her, because the only thing there to keep him company was a couple of little mice that he had to go to battle with. So, but there were rumors that he had gotten quite close to two of the singers. One was Barbara Garrel, and she played the role of Papagena, and her husband, incidentally, played the role of Sarastro. And then there was also Anna Gottlieb, and she sang the role of Pamina. And then in addition to these two singers, there were also rumors about a student of his named Magdalena, who was married to a fellow Freemason by the name of Franz Hofdemel. Well, three ladies. Yeah, and the last story actually gets even juicier because apparently the day after Mozart died, uh, Franz Hofdemel attacked his wife with a razor. He uh, actually injured her quite badly before slitting his own throat, the reason being that apparently he had found out about her affair with Mozart, and so he decided to kill both of them, and apparently he also poisoned Mozart, so that was the reason for Mozart's death. Well, that's a story we don't often hear. That's right, and you have to take it with a grain of salt because there are an awful lot of legends and stories. So, anyway, to get back to this little cottage, mm -hmm. how did it come to Salzburg? So, after the premiere of the Magic Flute and Mozart's death shortly thereafter, this little cottage more or less fell into disuse because the Freihaus Theater, in spite of being wildly successful, actually went out of use in 1801. And this little cottage was only renovated by the then owner, Prince Georg Adam von Starenberg, on the year 1806. And then after that, it was used as a kind of a rental property. And then finally, in 1873, the 
subsequent owner, whose name was Prince Camilo Heinrich von Starnberg, gifted it to the International Mozart Foundation. And it has stood here in this place ever since then. Actually, no, it's moved all over. So the first place that it came to was the Zwergel Garden of Schloss Mirabel, but that wasn't a very good location for it because it was really disrespected. And apparently, even some visitors cut little pieces of wood out of it so that they could have a souvenir for themselves. So they dismantled it and it sat around in a couple of other locations until in 1877 it was then put on Kapuzinerberg and they had a gigantic celebration for it at that time and there were so many flowers and wreaths that the entire cottage was filled with these tributes to it. And then unfortunately during World War I it was damaged and then furthermore a large snowstorm apparently ruined the roof and the subsequent moisture rotted a lot of the wood and so it was renovated again and then came unfortunately World War II and it was heavily damaged because of bombs but in 1950 it then had its kind of third birthday and it was renovated and moved into the Bastion's garden of the Mozarteum but it has survived it has indeed one question where did the story that Schikaneda locked Mozart inside here originate? Probably from the fact that Schikaneda was getting nervous that Mozart had not finished the music. Mozart had written the majority of the opera in the previous six months, but then he suddenly got a commission from Prague to compose La Clemenza di Tito for the crowning of Leopold II as King of Bavaria. And so Mozart and Constanze had to hurry off to Prague returning to Vienna just two weeks before the planned premiere of the Magic Flute. And it came up to two days before the premiere and he finally finished the overture and the March of the Ah, Princes. that would have made any presenter nervous. Yeah, I think so. And remember, Mozart was not only working on those two operas, but he was also working on the Requiem because he had gotten that mysterious commission. And he was working on his clarinet concerto and two Masonic that is a mind-blowing amount of music for one time. Mm -hmm. Wolfram must have been exhausted. Yeah, I think he probably was, but nevertheless he managed to conduct the first three performances of the Magic Flute and after that he went more or less every day bringing guests and relatives and friends and he even managed to be able to play a trick on Chickenator during a performance. What did he do? Well remember, Chickenator was the original Papageno. And on stage, Papageno plays a, a fake instrument because the music comes from a glockenspiel played backstage. Well, on one performance, Mozart replaced the glockenspiel player, and when the time for Papageno's music came, Mozart started playing something completely different. Um, Schikaneder was, of course, completely taken aback, but being the good actor that he was, he managed to make a joke out of it himself. The audience laughed, and everybody had a great time. Wolfel was quite a character. He was indeed. And you know, I think with all the successes that he had in 1791, he had every reason to believe that great things lay ahead for him. But then unfortunately, illness struck. Or, what some people say, he was poisoned. Well, I don't know whether I should believe that or not, but you know, there has even been a theory or a legend that he was murdered by the Freemasons for giving away too many of their secrets in the magic flute. Well, you know, one thing is for sure, the circumstances of Mozart's death will continue to fascinate music historians, music lovers, and conspiracy theorists for a long time to come. Well, Katie, thank you so much for this little magic excursion and servus bis bald. Thank you.